In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and from the dust of the ground he formed man in his own image. The Bible tells us that every human life is sacred, a reflection of God himself. Yet as we read the Old Testament, we encounter passages where this very God, who values life so deeply, commands the destruction of entire populations, including women and children. How can we reconcile this apparent contradiction? Why would a loving and just God order the annihilation of whole nations? In this video, we will explore these difficult questions, seeking to understand the nature of divine justice and the reasons behind these commands. The Bible begins with a profound truth. All human beings are made in the image of God, Genesis 1, 27. This is the foundation of the biblical view of life's sanctity. The commandment, you shall not murder, Exodus 20, 13, underscores the value God places on human life. From the beginning, God has affirmed the intrinsic worth of every person, and this theme runs throughout Scripture. But while life is precious, it is also God's to give and take away. The Bible teaches that God is the creator and sustainer of all life, Job 1, 21. He alone has the sovereign right to determine the span of our days. As the author of life, God also serves as the ultimate judge of human behavior, and he administers justice according to his perfect wisdom and holiness, Isaiah 13, 11. Yet despite the sanctity of life, the Bible also reveals the devastating impact of sin on the world. From the moment Adam and Eve disobeyed God, sin entered the world, corrupting humanity and distorting God's perfect creation. The world before the flood was filled with such violence and wickedness that God, in his justice, decided to cleanse the earth with a great deluge, sparing only Noah and his family. This act of judgment was not arbitrary, but necessary. God's holiness demands justice, and in the face of unrepentant sin, the justice sometimes takes the form of severe judgment. The flood was an act of divine mercy as much as it was of judgment, preserving a remnant through which God's plan of redemption could continue. As we turn to the conquest of Canaan, it's important to understand the context. The Canaanite nations were not innocent bystanders. They were deeply entrenched in practices that were abhorrent to God, including idolatry, ritual prostitution and child sacrifice. These practices weren't just morally corrupt, they were spiritually poisonous, threatening to lead Israel astray from the worship of the one true God. God had chosen Israel as his holy people, set apart to be a light to the nations, to fulfill his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God gave Israel the land of Canaan. But this gift came with the command to drive out the inhabitants of the land and destroy them completely, as stated in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. This command was not about ethnic cleansing. It was a divine judgment against a culture that had become utterly corrupt. The commands to annihilate entire populations, including women and children, are among the most difficult passages in the Bible. But these commands must be understood within the framework of divine justice. The concept of harem, or the ban, meant that certain cities were to be devoted to destruction as a form of judgment, as described in Joshua chapter 6, verses 17 to 21. This was not about personal vengeance or cruelty, it was about removing the cancer of sin that had taken root in these cultures. God's commands were specific, targeted, and meant to purify the land from idolatry. The destruction of these nations was a preventive measure to protect Israel from falling into the same sinful practices. The consequences of disobedience were severe as seen later in Israel's history, when they failed to fully carry out God's commands and were themselves led into idolatry and eventually faced their own judgment, as noted in Judges chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. The ethical dilemma posed by these commands is real and has been the subject of intense debate among theologians and scholars. 
Some argue that these actions are irreconcilable with the nature of a loving God. Others point out that as finite beings we cannot fully comprehend the mind of an infinite holy God. We must approach these texts with humility, recognizing that God's ways are higher than our ways, Isaiah 55, 8, 9. It's important to remember that the Bible is a unified story, and these acts of judgment are part of a larger narrative that points to God's ultimate plan for redemption. The same God who commanded these judgments is the God who sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for the sins of the world, offering salvation to all who would believe, John 3:16. Understanding the historical and cultural context of the ancient Near East is crucial. Warfare in that era often involved total destruction, and Israel's actions were not unique among ancient peoples. However, what set Israel apart was the divine mandate guiding their actions. Unlike other nations, Israel was acting under direct command from God, not out of a desire for conquest or wealth, but as an instrument of divine justice. Moreover, God's commands were specific to a particular time and place. They were not intended as a general rule for all times and all people. The commands to destroy the Canaanites were part of God's unique plan for establishing His covenant people in the land He had promised them. With the coming of Jesus Christ, we see the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, Matthew 5, 17. Jesus embodies God's perfect justice and mercy, offering a new covenant of grace. The harsh judgments of the Old Testament were never the final word. They pointed forward to a greater reality, the salvation that would be offered through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. In Jesus, we see the true heart of God, a God who desires not the death of the wicked, but that they turn from their ways and live, Ezekiel 33, 11. The destruction seen in the Old Testament foreshadows the ultimate defeat of sin and death accomplished through Jesus' death and resurrection. So how should we understand these difficult passages today? First, we must approach them with reverence and humility, recognizing that they reflect a God who is both just and merciful. These commands were specific to a particular moment in redemptive history and are not prescriptive for us today. Instead, they serve as a sobering reminder of the seriousness of sin and the holiness of God. Today, as followers of Christ, we are called to live out the principles of justice, mercy and love as revealed in the New Testament. We are not called to carry out divine judgments, but to be agents of reconciliation in a broken world. We trust in the ultimate justice of God, who will one day right every wrong and bring about the fullness of his kingdom. The commands given to Israel in the Old Testament are difficult, but they are part of a larger story a story that culminates in Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. In Him, we see the perfect balance of justice and mercy, the fulfillment of God's plan for humanity. As we wrestle with these challenging passages, let us remember that God's ways are not our ways, and His thoughts are not our thoughts. But in Christ, we have the assurance of His love, His justice, and His ultimate victory over sin and death. Thank you for joining us in this exploration of one of the Bible's most challenging topics. Please subscribe and share this video with three people.